Today's text comes from Matthew chapter 10, verses 34 through 42. Hear the word of the Lord. Do not think I have come to bring peace to the earth. I have not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, and a daughter against her mother, and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and one's foes will be members of one's own household. Whoever loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me, and whoever does not take up the cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Those who find their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake will find it. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet for being a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person for being righteous will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives a cup of cold water to one of these little ones for being a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. When we hear Jesus speaking, we expect to hear a message that is somehow a call to unity, a call to peace, a call to being one people gathered together in reconciliation, for that was the tenor of Jesus' basic message. It was the tenor of his ministry. We find that concept repeated in John's Gospel as he dedicates a whole chapter to Jesus speaking about unity among the disciples. We find it as the nucleus of Paul's ministry calling Jews and Gentiles to get along and to be one people. We find it a basic theme in Paul's writing to the Romans. Paul's writing the Corinthian correspondence, calling for unity beyond their diversity and division. It would seem a, a very simple concept. Love one another. Be united. We hear Rodney King's words in the aftermath of the L.A. riots after he had been beaten by police, saying, why can't we all just get along? Why can't we? It seems so simple. It seems easy to say, just love one another. And on a personal level, we can kind of do that. On an individual level, we can find people with whom we can sit down and share stories and come to know and understand and love and bring them into our circle of friends and acquaintances. The problem is that Jesus did not end his ministry there. He did not simply bring people into the circle of his acquaintanceship and offer them love and acceptance on a personal basis. He also challenged the norms of a society around him in the ways that they dealt with people, placing them into different categories and castes, levels of worth, levels of acceptance, differing levels and definitions of value. Jesus was not charged and crucified because he loved people too much. Jesus was not brought before the Sanhedrin because he fed poor people on the hillside. Jesus was not thrown before Pilate because he had healed people who were sick and ministered to people who were hurt. Jesus was crucified because he dared challenge the inequalities in the systems of life that called themselves righteous and worthy. Jesus was called because he challenged 
the way we use, wield, and respect power. Jesus was crucified because he defied the systems and the structures around him that did harm to the very people to whom he was actively ministering. You see, Jesus did not simply say, go and love your neighbor. He defined who that neighbor was by taking as an example a hated Samaritan. And casting this individual of an enemy people as the hero of the story, who reached out and acted in grace and love and care for someone simply because they were in need. He challenged systems and structures and attitudes in place that disqualified categories of people from coming into the inner circle of being members and full participants of God's reign. He challenged those who use and wield power for their own gains under the guise of building a secure, just, and stable society. He challenged it by offering reconciliation and grace and God's presence and love and care for those the society around him had discarded, marginalized, ostracized, and oppressed as being unworthy of God's love, God's attention, or the attention of those who counted themselves superior. That's what caught the attention of the religious leaders in Jerusalem. That's what caught the attention of the authorities who were concerned with the way Jesus might be leading a revolution of thought and action that would upset the apple cart of stratification of society, of demeaning certain classes of people, and elevating others. You see, when we think hardly about loving our neighbor, it means that I cannot be oppressing, endangering, or harming that neighbor if I'm going to claim to love him. Well, I could claim to love him till the cows come home. But as long as I am dehumanizing the person I claim to love, it is no love at all. John Wesley understood that principle as he established some basic rules for his societies. One of those was do no harm. He understood that love was the principal element of what it meant to be a disciple of Christ, but he also understood that our grasp of that concept is so often clouded by heritage and history and tradition. We fail to understand love because we fail to look upon those around us hear their stories, interact with them, and ask and seek to find out how they may be harmed by the very structures we uphold, by the society we cheer on, be it through political structures, economic structures, social structures, educational structures, cultural definitions by heritage, by icons, by words, by religious language that we would use. Do no harm requires that I 
engage the lives of those people around me who cry out that they are being harmed, to find out how I might be complicit in the harm they experience. You see, the structures that we build as society, as a civilization all around the world are structured around keeping the powerful in power, protecting those who have more to lose, for they have gained from the structures around us. That is simply the way of life. It is the natural order of things because we protect what is our own. And whether we intend to or not, we begin to dehumanize and decharacterize those who do not enjoy the same blessings and freedoms and protections that we ourselves enjoy. Do no harm is a higher bar for us to measure our actions by than the norms of society, than the ways that our traditions and heritages and cultures offer us as ways to gauge our righteousness. Growing up, I was taught by a beloved grandfather to shoot hawks because he understood that the hawks ate quail and he wanted to hunt quail, so he needed to take out the predators of the quail. My children taught me that birds of prey do not spend so much time harming game as my grandfather thought, but rather calling the sick and the weak from the covey, and more time actually ridding fields of rodents who would do harm to a farmer's agricultural bounty. I was taught by family to eliminate all snakes as danger and a possible threat. I was taught by a parishioner the black snakes serve a key role in the environment, protecting us from other poisonous snakes, eliminating rodents and from the fields, and doing a lot more to protect us and keep our lives healthy than any harm they might do. But you see, my heritage says, no, certain classes of life are of greater value than these others. Certain life is to be valued while other life is to be eliminated, ignored, downplayed. These are the ways of societies all around the world. Certain classes of people we elevate and protect, while other classes we step upon and oppress and ignore. We hear the cries of those we call friend, and we shut our ears to the cries of those we believe are deserving of the oppression in which we participate. You see, Jesus addressed some of those systems that dehumanized. And if we are to follow him in sincerity and embrace John Wesley's principle of do no harm, it means that we must likewise take up our cross to address those systems that oppress. Systems of economic, political, social, educational, whatever religious forms that deny the full humanity of God's grace.
creatures. That deny the full love and grace of God. That deny the principle of God's reconciliation to some lives that we consider of lesser value or import. If we would truly follow Christ, our lives will create division. Our lives will antagonize. Not that we are called to wield the weapons of violence and force and coercion, but our positive action of redeeming those who have been trod upon, who have been neglected, who have been oppressed, is itself revolutionary in scope because it calls for a revaluation of the structures of life all around us. If we would be faithful, if we would truly do no harm, we must assess the ways in which we are participants in structures that actively harm and oppress others. For I cannot love my neighbor while I am participating in that neighbor's oppression. And when I speak with a clear voice about those matters of oppression, it is likely to sow discord, enmity, and strife because it is a, a, a response, a challenge to those who wield power around me and those who are invested in keeping the status quo as it is for the benefit of some at the expense of others. Will I live according to the gospel principle of doing no harm? For only in that can I truly love my neighbor as the gospel of Christ requires.